Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Journeys, our midweek uh, uh, meeting. Tonight, we're going to study the story, one of my favorite stories uh, of Scripture, uh, one of my favorite characters of Scripture. Um, you know, there's, it's interesting when you look at biblical, the stories of biblical characters, um, the challenge always is that we only have a little bit of information. You know, we, we don't have a lot. And some characters less than others. And um, my wife always jokingly says that if only women had have written the Bible, the Bible would be four times larger. <laughs> <laughs> be a lot more conversational and uh, a lot more interesting to read. <laughs> um, so men are short on words, and um, tonight's story, uh, the, 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 this particular character, uh, we only have a few snippets of, of his journey, his life journey. Uh, now, that does not mean that there isn't information available. Uh, church tradition has some snippets of information about, about this individual. In fact, even Josephus speaks uh possibly speaks about this this man um so he was a very famous bible character um he met jesus um on one particular occasion that had a big impact on uh, has had the, the consequence of which has left an indelible impact on the christian faith um, and then uh, this individual uh, sort of went into hiding. He was, we might call him a um, faithful skeptic or a, 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 a skeptical follower. Um, maybe somebody might use the term a seeker who had not yet been converted. Um, or maybe. He was just an individual who saw himself playing a role in Jesus' life and felt as though that the, the position that he had been called to in his life journey, uh, he thought maybe he would maintain that position as a means of being able to influence those around him. So I'm trying to be very sketchy to get your brain, to get, you know, get the gray matter going. Um, anybody have any ideas of who I might be talking about? Josephus. <laughs> Perot. Perot. <laughs> Gray matter. <laughs> what does he call it, Laurie? The little gray cells? Yeah, the, the little gray cells, yeah. The little, the little gray cells, yeah. A um, few more hints. Um, this man uh, was... Um, May have, may have been wealthy financially, but if he wasn't financially well off, he certainly had in the, the, the French, uh, friendship and connections with those who were financially well off. Um, and he was on the inner circle, but not Jesus' inner circle. Gray cells. <laughs> Still too vague, hey? Not Joseph of Arimathea. <laughs> You're getting warmer. Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. oh. Nicodemus. Yeah, his name, uh, I just did a search on Nicodemus's name. Um, because I thought Nicodemus was mentioned in, in other than just the Gospel of John, but according to uh, my, my search here uh, in uh, Blue Letter Bible, which is a Bible software program, if any of you use Bible software and computers, I would highly recommend that you download Blue Letter Bible. Just go to, um, to Google 
type in Blue Letter Bible and download their software. It's a, I have a very expensive software on my computer, uh, which is, is a scholarly um, software, uh, which I, you know, I really like. I think it's very, very helpful, but it's very clunky and very awkward to use. And I, if any of you know my personality, I want, when it comes to computers, I want everything to be as simple as absolutely possible because uh, talking about gray matter, um, <laughs> <laughs> what I find difficult about computers is every place you go, you, there's, no, there's, no, there's no similarity in patterns. Every site you go to is different. Everything is different. And therefore, you can just never remember one day from the next, let alone, let alone one week from the next, or even you know, maybe one, you know, one month from, from the other. How the world can you remember what you did last time and how to get there, you know? Anyway, uh, Blue Letter Bible is a very, very easy software to use. Anyway, according to Blue Letter Bible, the, the, the name Nicodemus is only found, of course, in John chapter, what chapter? John chapter, yeah, I'm making it too difficult for you. Hi, Francis. Oh, she's holding up three. Either a, either a bad peace sign or you're saying three. <laughs> yeah, three, okay. It's a little dark there, so I can't quite see Francis. Yeah, John chapter three. And um, he's also mentioned in John chapter seven. His name comes up again. Uh, when the Pharisees, we're going to go there tonight, when the Pharisees are, uh, and Sadducees are thinking about what they're going to do with this, this, this man, this. Um, heretic and then he shows up of course again again in john chapter 19 now um well the name nicodemus does not show up in the other gospels that that doesn't mean that the, his part of that story isn't there it is there uh, of course because it's all about the, the burial of jesus and um so it probably mentions joseph of arimathea and then I don't know what word it might be used, and another man or something. I don't know. I didn't look it up. So anyway, that's the story we're going to, a story of, of faith that we're going to explore tonight is the story of Nicodemus. So if you have your Bibles, uh, let's go to John chapter 3. And I have uh, the New International Version that, in front of me. And um, I'd like to ask if, if, there are, if there's a volunteer, if you're, if you're willing to read, put up your hand and and. Maybe it will. Maybe we should have a, a quick word of prayer over over the scriptures, and then we'll we'll just uh, we'll just dive in here. And if, if some of you are willing to read, but let me just let's just bow our heads, have a quick prayer. Dear Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit as we open your Word. Be our guide in Jesus' name. Amen. So, John chapter three. Anyone willing to read? If not, I will. But uh, it's nice to give you an opportunity to to. Um, to participate. I don't see hands going up, so I'll read. Uh, this is, uh, again, I'm from, from the in, in International Version. Follow along, whatever translation you have, John chapter 3. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And that really meant that he was not just a Pharisee, but he was a Sadducee, because the Sadducees were actually the, the, the true leaders of Israel. Uh, they were the, the the Pharisees were the teachers of the law, but the the, the political zealots or the political elite, rather, that's a better word. I hate, um, uh, in Israel, were the Pharisees, uh, Sadducees. So he's a member of the uh, of the Jewish ruling council. In verse two, it says he came to Jesus at night, and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. No one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. I've I've often wondered when I read that. Um, again, you know, I was talking about you a little bit earlier, Lori, and I said that um, one of your fun statements that you said a while ago, I don't know where it was, but you were saying if, if only the Bible had been written by women, there'd be a lot, would be a lot more, a lot more interesting to read because there's so much not said. Like it might be the Bible, of course, be four times larger or something, you know. But it, it's such an interesting. We we have this 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 uh, uh, biography here. Um, of, you know, this late night meeting between Nicodemus and Jesus. And there's no 
there's no introductions. There's nothing. It just dives right in. Rabbi, we know, you know, it's like, you know, good evening or how are you or how's your, you know, where'd you come from? Or I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, um, we just have this rabbi. We know that you're a teacher who has come from God for no one can perform the signs you're doing. God would know them. So obviously that tells us that Nicodemus was very impressed by Jesus. He'd seen the with his own eyes the miracles that Jesus was performing. So it's not as though we have a man here who's coming to here because he's heard a rumor or he's heard other people talking. No, this is an eyewitness. This man is there because he has been impressed by what he's seen in Jesus. And so he's kind of he's kind of stroking Jesus a little bit, you know, he's kind of giving him a few. Uh, accolades here. He's saying, we know you must be sent from God. You're a teacher. Uh, and the, by the way, the, the word teacher, uh, rabbi, um, uh, in the original language, uh, is, let me just go back to it here. Pedagogue, I think it is. Let's just see here. Um, let me just go back here. Uh, a verse. Uh, no, that's the wrong way to go. John chapter three. Three. Um, yeah, here we are. Uh, Rabbi, yeah, Rabbi. We know that you're, uh, and uh, Rabbi, he said, uh, he said, Rabbi, we know that you, that, that thou art a, uh, the Daskalos, teacher, the Daskalos. So he's, you know, he's using all the right language. And then Jesus replies. And again, it's, it's, it's like there's no pleasantries between the two of them. It just goes straight to the facts. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So this is very abrupt, right? Rabbi Nicodemus says, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God, for no one can perform the signs you're doing if it were not for them. And he's, in other words, he's basically saying, I've seen you do these things. So we know that you must be a teacher sent from God. And then Jesus is saying, you're blind. <laughs> That's really what's going on here. I mean, cut to the chase. Jesus is saying, no, you're blind. You haven't seen a thing. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, he said, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And this term born again is a very interesting one in the story of Nicodemus. Uh, it, it points actually to a, to a background behind this story. And there is, of course, a historical context uh, that we, we don't get from, from what we're reading here. But the term born again was, was a very common phrase. Uh, it was used amongst Jews in reference to Gentiles who became Jews, who converted to Judaism. And they used to describe them as, as people who were born again. Uh, so Jesus is saying, number one, that you're blind, which is shocking. And number two, he's saying you must, he's, he, he's basically saying you, you need to be born again. And this was a stunning statement. Nicodemus found this really confusing. He says in verse four, how can any, how can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. So Nicodemus says, in his own mind, he's going, well, wait a minute, I'm not, I know this term born again, we use it all the time, but I'm, Jesus, how, what's he talking about? Does he know who I am? This is where Lori, this, you know, the background here, we don't have it here, you know. Um, if we don't know, you know, if Nicodemus introduced himself, you know, say who he was, what his portfolio was, give us a little bit of his, you know, CV or whatever, we don't know. Um, but he's he's stunned because he's going wait a minute born again i'm not a gentile you know i'm a i'm a teacher i'm a jew you know i was born a jew 
circumcised on the eighth day, bar mitzvah, you know, on my 12th year, raised in the rabbinic schools, educated, promoted. Um, some have suggested that Nicodemus was actually on the pathway to becoming Israel's next high, high priest. Um, and so he's absolutely stunned by this. Uh, <laughs> can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time in the womb. He, he's thinking, well, he must, he must be referring to, you know, being born a second time in the natural way of things, because it, it can't, what he's talking about here, can't, I can't be any more Jewish than I possibly am. I'm as, I'm as much a Jew as I can possibly be. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you're, you're, you can't even see the kingdom of God. You're blind. Um, so you need to be born again. And Nicodemus is very confused by this. Um, so then Jesus responds in verse 5. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. I was just, we was just going through this chapter. Francis, were you there a couple of weeks ago in Sook when, in Rest uh, Wanda Fuca? I, I took our, when I was with our small group there, I, we, we took them through this chapter. I don't know if you were there or not. Um, I hope I was. Yeah, yeah. Is, is that you, Francis, or somebody's yeah, talking? Yeah, about? sorry. I I don't know what you're meaning, whether anyway, or what your well, question is exactly, but I was probably okay. there. Oh, okay, okay. Anyway, um, so let me yeah get to the ch cut to the chase here. Um, so he's he's saying unless he's born of the water and of the spirit, and of course. Some would question, well, what, what is Jesus referring to there? Water? Is he, is he speaking about bapt John's baptism of immersion? And a lot of people say that's what Jesus is talking about. here. But the immediate context would suggest that maybe uh, Jesus is actually talking about natural birth, right? Because of the breaking of you know, of the water, and then the child is born, right? We don't really know for sure. Um, could be taken both ways. But Jesus is saying, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of the water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Uh, verse 7, you should not be surprised by saying you must be born again. The wind blows where, and this is the phrase that just, I, this is my, I love this story because I love what, what Jesus says here in verse 8. He said, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it has come from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Um, I'll never forget, never forget, years and years and years ago, I was a student at CUC, and Lori and I went to a Friday night Vespers, and there was a gentleman there who had a deep British accent, and he told this story in first-person narrative. And uh, he was a master storyteller, uh, very well polished in the King's English. Uh, and he led the student population through this story. Um, and, you know, you got a group of high school, the high school kids were mandated to be there for Friday Night Vespers. And then the college students were there, I think back then voluntarily, although maybe they were, I think they may have had a, credit system we had to go to so many vespers anyway my point being that it's not an easy crowd to work with necessarily you could have heard a pin drop in that place you remember that Lori? at all any oh you do remember that okay yeah a little bit it sure impacted me so he the way he described the story uh it, it was it was fantastic he he said he described nicodemus as being a religious scientist or a religious skeptic almost. And, and he referred to this story and said that Nicodemus in his day was much like the scientists of our day. You can't, you know, he was, unless you could, unless you could prove something, you know, the Jews were really big into science, right? Um, uh, what is Paul's statement about, you know, 
the, the Jews look for signs and the Greeks for, was it wisdom? I forget that verse now. Does anybody remember that? The Jews look for signs and the Greeks look for, I forget, maybe somebody will find that for me. But anyway, he's referring to Nicodemus and saying, you know, Nicodemus is, it's kind of like the skeptics of our day. In other words, in our day, you know, with a scientific mind, if you can't test something under, a, if you can't see it under a microscope or write it on a, on a chalkboard as a theorem, you know, a, 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 then you won't gonna, you're not going to believe it, right? And Jesus is saying you need to be born again. And Nicodemus is going, what in the world is this man talking about? I don't get it. And then Jesus starts talking about the Holy Spirit. And it's the, you know, it's the wind. And the way this, the speaker uh, all those years ago described this, it was like, he, he said, you know, think about the people in our day, uh, you know, every, everything needs to be tested. So let's, let's talk about love, he said. What kind of a theorem can you come up with for love? Like someone once said that a mother's tear is the best definition of, of love. But he said, take a, take a mother's tear and put it under a microscope. What do you get? What are you going to find? Salt and water, right? Is that a good definition of love? And so this, this speaker uh, in his King's, very proper King's English went on to say, so there's, there's Nicodemus and, and he's, he's a skeptic and Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And, he, and, and so he asked Jesus, he, Jesus asked, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And uh, Nicodemus said, well, uh, before, no, he said, he described it this way. He said, what's that sound, Nicodemus? And Nicodemus, you know, it was quiet. Nicodemus said, well, I don't know. I can, I don't know why I can hear the dogs barking in the distance. No, 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 Jesus said, what's that sound? Listen, Nicodemus. And so Nicodemus listened, and then he said, well, I can, I can hear the wind. And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you believe in the wind? Well, sure, Nicodemus said, I believe in the wind. And Jesus said, wait a minute, you can't see the wind. No. So how, how, how can you believe in something you can't see? And Nicodemus said, well, it's easy. I, 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 I can't see it, but I can see the evidence of it. It's rustling the leaves of the trees just above us. Oh, Jesus said, so is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And what a beautiful way of describing what's going on in this conversation here. The wind blows, Jesus said. He, Jesus said, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is it with everyone born of the Spirit. Um, when I became a Christian many years ago now, I had a very dramatic conversion. And then I met this beautiful blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl who was raised in the church. And I was very young and filled with passion, but had very little understanding of the, the breadth of, of spirituality. And so now I met this beautiful blonde haired blue eyed girl and we got talking about her faith journey and she hadn't had a dramatic conversion to christ like i did and i had a hard time understanding that <laughs> because i had no i just i didn't get it right I, I, all i knew was my experience right and, and um so we somewhere in those years i don't know if laurie or somebody turned me on to steps to christ which was a book that i'd read actually uh, years before my conversion and it had it stored away in my files somewhere but ellen white talks uh in the book steps to christ that there are you know she describes how there are lots of people who can never who cannot trace um the actual events uh, of their conversion you know that their conversion uh, uh happens over a, a much slower or longer period of time there's little steps along the way and so they don't have that dramatic conversion and i i think that's that's very true of a lot of people in, in faith you know especially those who've grown up in the faith right and um 
So anyway, we, we have this very interesting story here, you know, that the conversion, it's different for each of us, but, but conversion, Jesus saying here, is the, the third person of the Godhead, or what Alan White called the, the heavenly trio. Um, there, there must be a movement of, of the third person of the Godhead. This mysterious moving of the Godhead in the heart of a human being. And we don't, we can't really trace it. We don't really know exactly. But I, as I look at the story of Nicodemus, I, 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 I think that it's clear that Nicodemus left this evening, left that night, and he wasn't converted. He was impressed. Well, maybe he was, maybe, you know, because the conversion experience can be, um, Instead of being just dramatic, maybe it can be a little bit here, a little bit there, and it is a so slow growth. I don't know for sure. But I do think that, that Nicodemus left this meeting this evening and wasn't converted um, fully. Um, don't know how much more to say about that, but uh, it, it ends if we skip down uh, uh, to, let's say, it's, well, we can go to John chapter 3, verse 16. Of course, you all know it. For God so loved the world, Jesus said that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so he's he's basically saying that, that uh, you know, we now have this, this belief um, in, in Jesus. Jesus is saying, you have to believe in me. He talked a little earlier about Moses and the snake and you know, all that. Um, uh, but what Nicodemus didn't know is that a day was going to come when Jesus wouldn't be around anymore, right? Didn't know that. I mean, he, he doesn't know that. He doesn't know that what's coming. Uh, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes, there's that word again. So this, this word belief is really belief uh, in something you can't see with your eyes or hear with your ears, or touch with your hands. Um, Jesus says to doubting Thomas, blessed are you, uh, you know, because you have, you have believed in what you can see, but blessed are those who believe when they can't see. You remember that, folks? Remember that? <clears throat> this word belief here, you know, I've, I've talked with people over the years, my, my sister Jackie and I have talked, um, over the years about a number of things. And, and from time to time we touch on faith. And I've said to her, you know, Jackie, I, uh, I've entered into a covenant of faith. She said, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> I said, well, you know, covenant is a contract. It's an agreement, you know, and way back when I, I, I entered into a, an agreement to have a relationship with a, with a being that I can't see with my eyes or hear with my ears or touch with my hands, but I believe, and it's based on faith. Um, now that doesn't mean that folks that faith is, doesn't impact you, it does. But how else can you describe a relationship with, with, you know, with somebody you can't see with your eyes or with yours? It's faith, right? Believe. It's the word that we use. And that's what's going on here with Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus is saying, you've got to have faith, Nicodemus. You've got to believe. Uh, verse 18 whoever believes there, there's that word used the third time now in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe it's used again stands condemned already because they have not believed there it is again uh, in the name of god's one and only son verse 19 this is the verdict light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil verse 20 everyone who does evil hates the light will not come into the light for further deeds will be exposed. Now I want to pause on that verse. When did Nicodemus come to Jesus, folks? What time of day was it? The night. Ah. <laughs> yeah. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. I wonder, 
I wonder if that really hit Nicodemus. There they are in the dark. Maybe the only light was the was the moonlight above. Who knows? Maybe at that time of year, at that time, maybe it was a, maybe it was a you know a, a full moon. I don't know stars twinkling in the skies above. Or maybe it was an overclouded night. We don't know. Maybe the only light was just a little campfire. Maybe I, I don't know. Did they have campfires back? I don't. Know. I don't know. Maybe that's too North American of a thing. I don't know. But. If it was at night, it was dark, and Nicodemus came purposely in because he wanted to. He want, didn't want others to know that he was seeking Jesus out. And uh, light, Jesus is contrasting light and darkness, faith and disbelief. That's what he's doing here. This is the verdict: light has come into the world. People love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone, verse twenty-one. Who does evil hates the light, will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus here. You know, I always think of this sort of in the great grand global view, but there's, there's a real personal connection here. In verse 21, but whoever lives by the truth comes to the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Then all, verse 21 is really important to the story. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So Nicodemus is described here in this chapter as being in the darkness. Right? It's the darkness of doubt. Questioning faith, but still doubt. So then we pick up his story. Um, a little later now in, uh, uh, let's just go to it. Um, to, let's go to John chapter seven. Now, if you have your Bibles. <clears throat> so Nicodemus leaves that night. We don't know. We don't know what happened. He just left. Nothing, nothing said there. So we're now in John chapter seven. Um, and um, Jesus goes to the fest of, to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is um, Passover week, right? First comes the Passover, then comes the Feast of Tabernacles, commemorating their exodus from from captivity in, in Egypt. Jerusalem is a buzz with people. And Jesus, lo and behold, is teaching in the temple. And huge crowds are gathered around. And um, it says in verse 14 of John chapter 7, not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple court, so he began to teach. So he, he's speaking there and uh, then skipping down to verse 25. Would somebody like to read? Because I'm doing all the talking here. <laughs> verse 25? Yeah, let's let's read from verse 25. Um, I don't know if you want to read all right down to, to the end of the chapter, but um, maybe you could read 10 verses. Okay. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? So, so I want to pause right there, Adam, if you don't mind. There's that word again, belief, right? 
So the context of what's going on here is there's this great controversy going on. Are they going to believe who this man is or not? And as it says here, uh, verse 31, still many of the, they tried to seize him, by the way, in verse 30, but no one laid a hand on him. It's interesting. At this, they tried to seize him. What does that mean? But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So they tried to, so we don't really know what that means. They tried to seize him. There's, there's all kinds of, there's a whole bunch more story here in this single verse than, than we're getting here. Uh, but anyway, so there's, there's quite an issue. There, there's, there's controversy. There's conflict going on here. Verse 31, still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs? Will he perform more signs than this man? And so they're, 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 they're putting their belief in him. They're, they're putting their belief based upon the signs they're seeing. And then, yeah, a couple more. Read down to verse 35. Uh, Adam, if you don't mind. We're beginning to pick up verse 32 again. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go? that we shall not find him. Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? And then verse 36, 5, let's, let's okay. stop, what, five, stop reading. What manner of saying is this that he said, ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come? Yeah. <clears throat> what does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 6? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. But Jesus is saying, look, there's a time coming when you will look for me, you won't be able to find. And they're all scratching their heads. You know, he 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 loved to speak in riddles, right? Um. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to skip down now to to verse 45. And. Uh, Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? So these, these guys had been sent to arrest him, right? And they're ticked off because they didn't bring him back. And then they, they responded. No one ever spoke the way this man does. <laughs> so... Here they were sent on an assignment to arrest to arrest Jesus, and they found themselves mesmerized. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Adam. They're, they're, they're listening to this to this speaker, and they're 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 transfixed. You know, no one ever spoke the way this man does in the prior life. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers? Now, here's a very interesting question. By the way, Gerald just, oh, yeah. hi, Gerald. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? This is a very interesting question. Okay, to this story. You mean he's deceived you also? And then to, to try to show how stupid, to make them stupid, to look stupid, you know, they're looking around the crowd and they say, oh, wait a minute. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But what they don't know is that there was a contingency right in their very midst of the leaders of Israel who were being convinced or maybe were convinced. We don't know for sure exactly where Nicodemus is at, but watch how he shows up now in this story. Remember what we read in John 3 about the darkness and the light? You know, some live in the darkness. And Nicodemus left that night in the darkness and Nicodemus must have pondered to himself, am I gonna, am I gonna come into the light? Mm. You know, he's got that question on his mind, right? So verse 48, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Ah, and then verse 50. <laughs> 
Would somebody read 50 to 52? Anybody willing to read? I'll read it. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Ben. Verse 50 to 52. Then Nicodemus, the leader who had met with Jesus earlier, spoke up. Is it legal to convict a man before he is given a hearing? He asked. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search the scriptures and see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. The most ancient Greek manuscript do not include John 7. Oh, that's, that's an addition. <laughs> that's an addition, yes. Mm. Yeah. That's the end of 52. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Nicodemus, I want to ask you guys now. Has Nicodemus come into the light yet? Or is he still in the darkness or is he straddling the fence? Where, where do you think Nicodemus is at in his journey at this point? Any thoughts? I'm, I'm assuming your, your quietness means you're really thinking. <laughs> I, I want to say something. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, when he meets him in the dark and flummoxes him with, you don't know anything, you can't see it, you're blind. Mm -hmm. There's a reference to Ezekiel 36, and it's a stony heart. You know, I'll train, I'll change your heart of flesh to a to a heart of flesh. I'll change your stony heart to a heart of flesh. It's 36, 26. Mm -hmm. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit will put within you. And I will take out of your flesh a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And this is talking about compassion and uh, an event that, that's divine that has to do with something invisible because it's about your heart. Mm -hmm. So Nicodemus knew this stuff but maybe he had time to look at it before finally he's it's dawning on him maybe there's an internal thing going on here that i didn't get or maybe this guy has something that i don't have i don't know are you i'm not sure what you're saying francis you're talking about yourself personally or no about nicodemus one by the time you get to chapter oh, so nicodemus, seven nicodemus is asking maybe this guy has something going on or is teaching something that i don't have and i wanted to know what it was like because i read it in ezekiel yeah. this change of heart what does that have to do and if it is kindness because obviously jesus is so compassionate That'd be something he wouldn't understand, but he might want. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I don't think it's such a new concept to be born again for a Jewish person. Yeah. That, and yet the Pharisees sure were mean about it. I don't know. It's, it's hard even for us born on the bus, like you said, for us to know a big difference between before and after that's invisible mm. have i ever really gotten it or am i you know a stuck pharisee too you know i remember years ago yes uh bonnie are you got your hand up or you're you're muted bonnie can can we hear what you were going to say and then i'll tell you 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 wanting me to me to speak? Yes, because you started to say something, and I wasn't okay. <laughs> <laughs> speak on. I, I mean, it's, I was just going to add a little filler to to this conversation that we're having, and what we're reflecting on. That Francis was saying years ago when I was a pastor in Medicine Hat. I'll try to keep this short. We we had the uh, the uh, one of our the the people folks from the conference office and uh, had a prayer ministry. Uh, and they came down to my church in Medicine Hat and uh, Evangela Menavarpu, I think that was correct, right, Lori? Evangelist, Evangelist. But anyway, um, so they came in Sabbath morning for church. They did their thing, and that church was packed. Then we had lunch together. And then after lunch, most of the members went home. 
but it had been well advertised for weeks in advance that we were having this major prayer emphasis. And so now instead of 125 people, we're down to 30, let's say. And I'm sitting around at the back, quietly listening to Evangeline and her group talk about prayer. And I'm looking around at the congregation and I'm thinking, it's interesting. I mean, I know I love all these people, but the reality is, is that there's very few in that congregation that's there, the, the remnant, let's say, who I would sort of naturally be connected to socially with. Um, maybe, maybe a couple of them, but most of them, uh, I love these people dearly, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but I just thought, you know, that these are not really people I would normally associate with. Uh, we sort of travel in different circles, but here we're all here together. And, I, and, it, and it just really hit me. I don't know why it hit me that day, but it hit me so powerfully. I've never forgotten it. I thought, these are my people. These are my people. And the reason they're my people is because they're interested in seeking the divine one, the invisible divine one, the one who speaks to your heart, even though you can't hear him audibly, the one who you feel the embrace of God's love, even though you can't feel his touch. Uh, you you uh, you know you're, you're able to have cold conversations with 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 this God with a being that you you know you can't you know you're not speaking face to face and and that's why these are my people these are my people you know not just, not because I'm their pastor I'm we're 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 a family we're a family of faith and that's why we're seeking because we're all seeking after the same thing. Um, and that's, I think, what Nicodemus and Francis is referring to. There's this growing awareness of Nicodemus. I don't think he's quite there yet, but he's now at a point where a place where he's stepping out of the shadows. He's starting to say, oh, wait a minute here. Uh, does our law condemn a man who, without first hearing him, uh, to find out what he's been doing? In other words, he's saying, no, you guys, wait a minute, we need to listen to this guy. Right? Anyway, that's what I was going to share. Bonnie. <laughs> so now go ahead fascinating thank you um i always think about the verse that says how these things have been written beforehand for our learning so this story uh, obviously was uh an example he's using nicodemus as an example of how conversion happens but it made me think of some of the people i pray for and of course we all pray for some people and um, I look for changes in the person or the situation because I'm praying for them. And then sometimes I just don't believe uh, very much. I'm blind. I'm praying for this person, for the indwelling spirit for this person. And I can see obvious change, but I still feel like some of that old person is there and I'm still scared of them because of what they did before and this type mm -hmm. of thing. And I'm thinking like, um, is this easy or hard, this wind stuff? You know, this wind comes and it changes you over time. And mm -hmm. um, it definitely, we know in ourselves, uh, if we were to admit some of the things we did in the past and try to sell you on what they are now, you'd think of the terrible things we did in the past and you wouldn't want to for, forget those. Those are were just so awful that you must still be the same. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I think about, you know, the wind and how it listeth, Jesus said, you know, and I think in my own case, my goodness, you know, I've changed so much. Mm -hmm. And poor Nicodemus, the next time we hear about him, he's put money on helping to bury Jesus. And yeah. he thinks, oh, there must have been some change. <laughs> the wind <Yeah>. got him. <laughs> well, let's go there. Let's go there, Bonnie. Let's go to John chapter 19 now. And let's, let's conclude this. Thank you for sharing that. I really do appreciate that very much. So we'll, we'll pick it up in verse 30. John, if you have your Bibles, chapter 19. Verse 30, Jesus on the cross. When he'd received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
So Jesus laid his kingly head upon his, his breast and, and, and died. Then verse 31. Now it was, and by the way, um, well, let's, let's read this. Now it was a preparation day, or day of preparation, as it is in the NIV. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath, the Passover, right? Uh, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony. This is very interesting. And his testimony is true. The man who saw it has given testimony. And this testimony is true. Who is this man? He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. Who is that man in verse 35? Now, we don't know. It could be the soldier who pierced Jesus' side. It could be someone else. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled, verse 36, that one of his bones would be broken. And, the, and, and as another and scripture says, they, uh, they will look on the one they have pierced. So now we come down to verse 38. Later, Joseph of Merith, Arimathea, asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. And notice what it says here. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 25 pounds, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. In the place where, they, where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, in the garden a new tomb in which one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Well, I would say that Nicodemus had now come out of the darkness. Now, granted, it's still kind of safe because he's now, you know, um, carefully caring for the, the life uh, for the body of a dead man. So that might be a little safer, but um, I would say that something has happened in Nicodemus's journey. He has gone from darkness. He's now, I would say he's not, if not fully in the light, he's stepped out of the shadow. And we're later told that Nicodemus, along with others who were wealthy, used their financial means to support the early church so it's the story uh, this is the, the story of the journey of one uh, of one man's journey to faith it's it's such a beautiful story it's just it's magnificent um and and that's why folks you know i i was talking to someone the other day and i said you know it's a little discouraging there's there's not a lot of people joining us on wednesday nights uh because someone was asking me and i said but you know i don't care i said because I have a passion for this. I just really think that uh, that um, exploring the story of, of of the journeys of faith is is is, is worth it. You know, it's just uh, it's the it's the inherited gift of the ages for all of those who will. You know, Jesus, as we heard, referred to it earlier. You know, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Um, you know, we come seeking this, you know, uh, uh, Jesus said, you know, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testament. Remember that from the book of mm -hmm. Revelation? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's why we gather together, because we, we, we are encouraged by the, the stories of other, the, the journeys of other men and women and their stories of faith. And that's what this Wednesday night midweek meeting is all about. Um, and I eventually hope to turn this into a podcast. Gary and I are talking about that. Um, so eventually we'll we'll get get to that place. But right now, uh, we're certainly I'm certainly enjoying doing this, and 
And I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories in scripture. It's the story of Nicodemus. Um, the journey from darkness to light. That's what it's really all about. And uh, this man's life was transformed. I, I, let, me, let me conclude now by going back to, um, you know, how I've preached sermons on this over the years and, and how I've connected the story of Jesus talking to Nicodemus about um, the wind, right? And we don't really know for sure if Nicodemus was there at Calvary um, because the scripture doesn't say so. But I suspect that Nicodemus was. I think that he followed the crowd out there. And I have in the past pictured Nicodemus standing there. He watches Jesus cry out that, those, say those final four words, it is finished, final three words. He, he lays his head upon his chest and breathes his last. And, it's, and, and, and then Nicodemus, you know, um, while that whole thing's going on, you know, there's a sign put above his head and Nicodemus feels this breath of wind. Wow. Feels this breath of wind. And all of a sudden he remembers that conversation from years before. So is everyone who's born of the spirit. And it's like, it's almost as if Nicodemus hears Jesus saying, Nicodemus, you, you believe in the wind, but you can't see the wind. Oh yeah, but I see it moving the trees. I, I, I hear it rustling the leaves. I know it's real. And then all of a sudden Nicodemus remembered that conversation. And, they, and then all of a sudden, you know, he breathes while Jesus breathes his last. And in that moment, his heart is changed. You know, I don't know if that's just uh, my own dramatic way of describing it. But, but, but also, was, yeah, go ahead. Uh, also, go ahead. that promise that he said, if I be lifted up, and if Nicodemus was there draw, looking up. I draw all men unto me. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, the journeys of faith. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Bonnie. Well, I looked up in the Desire of Ages, and I thought there was a key thought here we could add to. Uh, Mrs. White said the figure of the new birth, which Jesus had used, was not wholly unfamiliar to Nicodemus. No. Converts from heathenism to the faith of Israel were often compared to children just born. No. Therefore, he must have perceived that the words of Christ were not to be taken in a literal sense. For by virtue of his birth as an Israelite, he regarded himself as sure of a place in the kingdom of God. He felt that he needed no change. Hence, his surprise at the Savior's words. He was irritated by their close application to himself. The pride of the Pharisee was struggling against the honest desire of the seeker after truth. He wondered that Christ should speak to him as he did, not respecting his position as ruler to in Israel. And then this other little part, surprised out of his self-possession, he answered Christ in words full of irony. How can a man be born when he's old? Yeah. Um, and anyway, like many others, when cutting truth is brought home, to the conscience, he revealed the fact that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. There is in him nothing that responds to spiritual things, for spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, on um, page 141 of Desire of Ages, uh, it says, after Ellen White writes, after the Lord's ascension, when the disciples were scattered by persecution, Nicodemus came boldly to the front. He employed his wealth sustaining the infant church that the Jews had expected to be blotted out at the death of Christ. In the time of peril, he who had been so cautious and, and questioning was firm as a rock, encouraging the faith of the disciples and furnishing means to carry forward the work of the gospel. He was scorned and persecuted by those who had paid him reverence in other days. He became poor in this world's goods, yet he faltered not in the faith, which had its beginning in that night conference. With Jesus. Beautiful. No? <laughs> that makes me pulls on my heartstrings too. Yeah, it's such a beautiful story. The journey of one man's faith, right? Um, so anyway, uh, uh, yeah, great, great story. 
and worth our our deepest contemplation. Well, it's uh, folks, it's 802. I want to thank you so much for coming and uh, joining us. Um, I wonder if somebody would be willing to have closing prayer for us tonight. Yeah, Bonnie, please. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us to meet together for the um, wonderful insights we're led to learn, and especially about the long and patient wooing of the Holy Spirit, like the wind. Mm. Place faith in that and continue to pray with belief and hope for those on our prayer lists and for ourselves. May we not turn away from the truth about our own spiritual conditions. Thank you for this evening. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming, folks, and for joining us uh, for another uh, edition of Journeys, Stories of Faith from uh, Sacred Text to Living Testimony. May God richly bless you, and uh, we'll see you Sabbath morning. Bye.